there's a story in everything, everything. And one of the things I always share with a lot of people, look at yourself, look at your shoes, look at your ring, look at your arm, look at your clothing. If you cannot look at anything that you're wearing and come up with a story, go do something wearing that so you have a story. My name is Greyhawk Perkins, uh, and I am a storyteller, a musician, a writer, an artist. I do visual arts. I do uh, um, uh, woodworking. I do, you name it, uh, history. I do a lot of different things. Storytelling means a lot because it's traditional, you know, and uh, it, it's the way to pass on your history, story of your family, but also we will walk in Bibles of our culture. We didn't have written down stuff. We didn't have television. We didn't have this. And a lot of that stuff that we, we had to learn were from these storytellers. With me, I, I never, ever set out to be a storyteller. It just happened. As far as tribal, uh, very important because I don't think if I would have gathered the stuff that I've gathered throughout the years, we would have a lot of that stuff uh, because in, in a lot of communities, a lot of storytelling, you don't see that, especially the type that I do. You don't see that a lot too much anymore. Not only telling the old stories, but developing the new stories because a lot of people always think that our history is in the past. No, we are making our history. And so, yeah, I remember the history in the past, but I also got to remember that there are going to be kids coming up that are going to need to know what I know now in the stories that I'm writing now. So, yeah, it's very important. It's very important for them to maintain our culture, uh, the histories of our family. And it's not just Native American. I mean, I, I, I see that across the spectrum, across the board with all the cultures the African-American community, the Irish community, the German community, the Jewish community, all of them. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, they will maintain these storytellers like I'm doing, uh, because I hate to see these cultures. When your stories disappear, your culture disappears. There are two things that make a culture disappear. When you lose your language and you lose your stories. Once you do lose those two things, you have no more culture anymore. Now, uh, my tribe uh, is encouraging me to tell, tell a lot more stories. You know, I'm, now I'm getting older, I'm, I'm getting a little bit, no, I really don't have much time, but I, I'm making the time uh, to start sharing the stories more. Now that we have stuff like this, where we can videotape these stories and we can do uh, documentation on a lot of these stories, if I'm not able to go physically do that, they can still see them. I never really thought of myself as a storyteller, never. Um, I mean, I was in my 40s, and I, you know, I'd been telling stories, God, for years in schools, I mean, I'm teaching and doing all this stuff, writing and everything, but never considered myself a storyteller. And uh, I was in uh, Washington, and uh, they had called me to, to go to, to Native American and to Smithsonian. And they said they wanted me to come and, and, and do a program. And uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do. They, they, they flew me there and I got there and I figured it was going to be a whole bunch of Native Americans there and it was going to be a big event. Well, I got there and the Native American Museum was, was pretty much empty. When I got there before it opened, there were no other artists. And uh, everybody knew who I was when I got to the back gate, the door. And they said, oh, we've been seeing your picture on the marquee for a week. And I said, well, you're the only one that's doing the program this week. And I went, really? And at that point, I went, oh, the Smithsonian recognized me as a storyteller. So I must be a storyteller, you know? And at 60, almost 65, I still don't know everything. I'm still learning every day, and I hope I get, I get to be like my grandmother, who's almost 100 years old, so I got another, you know, at least 35 more years to pick up more things that I can share. Sometimes I walk into a room, and uh, there's no story in here. Nothing at all that I'm even thinking about any story in the past. 
But all of a sudden I take and I look at you. And I look into your eyes. And all of a sudden a story happens that I've never told before. That's a storyteller. And then you sit back and hopefully somebody recorded it because after you tell it, you probably won't remember it because it was the spirit of the moment. That's a real storyteller. And it took me years to realize that's what a storyteller is. It's not only telling your story, but sharing with you, but also picking up the energy from you and the things that you might need at that point. And that's happened to me a lot in my life. Storytelling, it, 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 for some reason, just came pretty much natural. Um, uh, didn't realize, like I said, didn't realize I was a storyteller. I just thought it was talking. But I, you know, but that led to one day uh, me sitting down and having an elder say, uh, you got these stories, you need to, uh, you need to document some of this stuff. And so I was in school and I begged, you know, in, in school, a lot of Native Americans, we didn't get to put in certain classes that we normally would be allowed to go in. And they'd always try to take, want you to take shop and do this and do that. But me, I kept fighting to get into speech class, into writing class, into an art class for some reason. And I did, I had one teacher that got me into uh, a speech class in a writing class. And I started documenting things that, that, that I was thinking about that became stories later on, you know? So uh, that's where the writing came into and, uh, and documenting and writing the, the things that I was, I was thinking. But then also uh, the art, because uh, my art like this here, I have a uh, um, story about the egret. And so uh, the story will give me an idea, what, what, what do I want to show? Uh, and I want to be able to show them a, a, a picture. Best way to do it, show what's in here, is put it on here. And that way I can add it to my story and they can see a visual. And uh, as I got older, uh, I loved beating on things too. Uh, and I remember my first drum set uh, that I got, I was probably about four or five years old. So uh, here I am telling stories at four or five years old. My father gets me a drum set at four or five years old. Uh, I'm around all these elders that are telling stories. So it was like inevitable, it was gonna happen. Uh, my music, even my, my songs, um, and even the ones that I don't sing in English, I, I will tell a story of that song and what it means. Like, you know, Chestnut Moon is about Congo Square, but it's about the Native American and the African American coming together at Congo Square, sharing food, culture, a lot of different things. And I wrote that song about that because I have friends of mine that are descendants of the people that originally from Africa that came and used Congo Square because they couldn't go anywhere else. And then I'm a descendant of the people that originated Congo Square. And so we're still friends. And so I like to tell those stories. And so all these stories that I tell are from personal experiences. You know, and, and, and my music, it's the same way. If I can't, if I'm gonna do a song and I can't tell a story for that song, I'm not gonna do that song because it doesn't mean anything. Uh, this drum I use because it sounds like a water drum and we only have certain few songs that we use drums with, but every song that we have is either written with the rattle or used with rattles. And our women are our shakers. They, they will put rattles on their legs and they will keep the rhythm for us. The men will sing and they keep the rhythm. Without the women, we can't do anything. We can't start ceremonies, we can't do anything. So these songs not only honor our culture, but honor our women. To, again, like we said, there are, are, are without our women, none of us would be here. And so our songs we, we, we are about the women, the children, and our friendships and all. So I wrote this Congo Square song, and I want to do it, and uh, uh, hopefully I can do it justice even though I wrote it, because I usually don't do it by myself, you know? Oh, yeah. 
I wrote an album called 13 Moons, and I was in a hospital bed, and I had nothing else to do, so I needed, and I, plus I thought I was not gonna live till the next day, you know? So I started writing this, this 13 Moons album, and it's taking tradition, plus a little bit of my life, and putting it into chants, traditional chants, that have become albums and also have become funk and, and, and blues songs and everything else, because I'm a musician, I'm a writer. So a lot of these chants will eventually become maybe classical music, or they might become blues, or they might just become a story or a chant. But usually most of them become stories and chants first. And we talked about Congo Square. Well, this, so, this song I wrote for the chestnut moon because it's at that time when the, we, we roast the chestnuts and we do these and, and we have our campfires and all this stuff. And the Native American would be off in the distance here and you could, they could see Congo Square and they could see the Africans because the Africans could not um, practice their religion and their culture within the walls of the rampart. That's why it's called Rampart Street. Uh, it was a, a, a fort. There were four, four forts around New Orleans, what we call the Vieux Carré. And inside those forts, they were not allowed to do those things from Africa in there. So they went outside the gates, or the, the ramparts, in Congo Square, and that's where they did their ceremonies, and that's where they did stuff. And the story is that the Native Americans that were still there, because they were still on Bayou Road and a lot of other places, they were sitting back and they were watching, and they were listening to them sing, call, answer, and some of the things. They go, wow, that's kind of similar, the call and answer, because we're call and answer people. And because we do stomp, we do call and answer. And so the Native Americans were sitting there watching, and they eventually got closer and closer and closer. And eventually, were able to meet up with the Africans that were there and not only learn what they were doing, but share their call and answer, share their stories, share their songs and their dances, which makes why you need, to go, I always call Congo Square the birthplace of American music. It's when you got the European culture, you got the African culture, the Caribbean culture, you got this, you got that, and the Native American culture come right there. That's where it started. And uh, everybody was kind of trying to claim American music. No, it's right there, Congo Square. I always tell people when you think you're the only person in a boat, you're not looking in the boat too well. Um, because a lot of people that have come here uh, and that were here have been through some hardships, uh, been through some horrible things. And they were not just black or white, you know, whatever. There were many different cultures that came here and mistreated. And I try to tell people, I say, we need to all know about that. We need to know about all the things that have been done wrong to all the people here, but all the good things that have been done here. Uh, and like our food, I mean, perfect example. If you eliminate the Native American ingredients in most of the Louisiana food, you have nothing. Because they brought their recipes here, but they didn't bring the ingredients. They had to use the ingredients that we had here. So if you take the Native American ingredients out of those dishes, you have nothing left. They have to go to other countries to get that stuff. That alone, but also too, the things that we have gained as Native Americans that other people have brought us, their dishes, like gumbo, okay? People, a lot of people don't realize that it's not Cajun and it's not Creole, it's African, you know? Because that's what they call the okra. And, but to make filet gumbo, that's Native American and African because the filet is the sassafras leaves that we ground up to make filet with. So if you start looking at all the things in those dishes that we have now, then you break them down 
I always tell people, if you don't like and you, you, you're prejudiced against the culture, stop using the stuff that that culture has contributed to our society for one year, and you're going to love that culture again. I'm a descendant of the Mound culture here. Mound culture is very, very old. So that means that my family has been here for thousands of years. As a Native American, as an elder, as a storyteller, and as a person that uses the plants and the, and the things that I use, this is where, this soil is where I'm from. I'm made up from this soil. If you take my hand and put it down there, I'm the same color as the soil down there. And my ancestors are here. The mounds were built here. I can't go anywhere else. This is where I'm, I'm cemented to. Uh, I always wonder how other people can just say that they're part of their culture and they go somewhere else and, and, and work with other people. No, you stay amongst, you, you, you're here, you stay amongst your people and you share the knowledge with your people. That's how your people are going to grow. That's how they're going to know your culture, they're going to know your history, they're going to know your medicines, they're going to know the stories. You have to stay with your people. And to me, yeah, I've been around the world, but you know what? Right here, this soil is where I'm from, and that's where my makeup is from. If I go by the old story that our people came from the earth, the Muscogee people came from the earth, this is where we came from, and this is where I got to be put back, and this is where I'm the strongest. This is where my stories are the strongest. This is where my medicine is the strongest. You know, people go ask me, do you use sage in your ceremony? I don't because sage doesn't grow here, but I use cedar. And the Native Americans ask me all this thing, do you use sweetgrass? No, sweetgrass don't grow here, but I use cedar, you know, and uh, I use the medicines that are here. I use the stories that are here because that's the way I'm supposed to teach because I'm from this earth here. You know, this is where I'm from. That's why I'm gravitated back here. And I think that's why sometimes other people from other cultures feel sometimes that they're lost because they don't go back to where their roots are. And they need to sometimes, because you need to get that energy from that earth where you're from, where your ancestors are from, to get, like when people go, people go to the Mecca. My Mecca's here. My Mecca's here. The mounds, that there are, that's our Mecca. The, 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 we have mounds here where I live. And these things are dating back 12, 12, 1200 years or more. And so I don't have to go. This is, this is where I get recharged, where I get rejuvenated. I was given an award by the governor's office as a Louisiana cultural bearer. And I thought, you know, it's not a burden. It's, wow, they actually recognize what I've done. But also, too, it's humbling, very humbling. And, uh, but it's an honor. Because how many people get to do this? How many get people get to be called a cultural bearer and you actually get a certificate saying you're a cultural bearer? Uh, that's not a lot. And one of my, my co-workers that I work with in one of my sites that I work at said, you know, you realize how many millions of people live in Louisiana and you were one of six that were appointed as a cultural bearer? Uh, and I went, wow. No, it's not a burden. It's, it's, it's definitely an honor. And it's not just an honor. It's an honor now because now as a cultural bearer, I'm going to be able to, I'm going to, be able to uh, uh, reach a lot more people. Because now that I'm a culture bearer, more people start to come to me and ask me questions and talk to me. And now all the things that I've been wanting to share, the stories that I want to share, the, 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 the you know, what, what the things I think about now that I want to share. Now they're coming to me and saying, hey, can you tell us? Where before I was getting it, but not on this level. So no, it's not a burden. It, it's, it's, it's an honor and, and, and it's, it's thrilling because I, I'm sitting here at a 65 year old person saying, wow, I'm just starting. You know, this is a new start for me, you know? And uh, so yeah, culture bearer, no, it's, 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 it's an honor and, and it's uh, something that's very special. And now I'll never look at it as a burden. Important for me is to have one day my great-grandchildren and my grandchildren say, that was my grandfather. You know, not just 
come into this world and go out of this world and nobody even knew that Greyhawk stories exi existed or Greyhawk even existed. Yeah, storytelling is very important. And, and again, it's to share and to, to let people know that you can accomplish a lot of things. You can do things that you never thought you could. I never thought I would be doing I never thought I'd be sitting here with you guys or I'd be, you know, on a plane to France or wherever or uh, doing anything uh, when I was a kid. But it happened because one thing I, I, I have to tell you, I never ever said no. When you have an opportunity to go somewhere, to listen to somebody, to talk to somebody, to travel and meet the Dalai Lama, whatever, like stuff that I've done, uh, don't ever say no because you might never get that chance again.